Hi. I hate that we're still not together, but we'll make the most out of the time that we're apart and still spend a little bit of time digging into the Word of God, making sure that we're uh, still learning the, the lessons that come from the text that we're studying. We are in 1 Samuel because we have begun talking about the kings, and today we're going to be introduced to the first king of Israel. And that's kind of exciting. There's a lot to learn from King Saul. Our text for today's lesson uh, begins in 1 Kings chapter 8, and we're going to go from chapter 8 all the way down through chapter 12. Most of us are probably fairly familiar with the stories found in these chapters, the rejection of God and the rejection of Samuel as the people desire to have a king, and then the introduction of Saul and uh, the, the way he started out, and it seems so very promising because of the way things started out, uh, but you'll find very quickly in this story that things start to turn for the worse. But let's go ahead and jump in. The first king chapter 8 and make sure we understand the story that's happening and then we'll finish up with a few lessons first kings chapter 8 is where the people actually demand a king it says samuel's grown old and because he's grown old uh, his sons are kind of stepping in and doing the job just like eli's sons were doing for him but unfortunately samuel's sons are Quite a bit like Eli's sons. Uh, they were judges in Beersheba, but his sons did not walk in his ways. Uh, they took dishonest prophets. They took bribes. They perverted justice. Uh, and so you've got them uh, kind of involving themselves in, in some of the same activity that Eli's sons were involved in. His sons were involved in uh, d defrauding the sacrifices and defrauding the women that would come to the tabernacle. Uh, these sons seem to be more focused on uh, economic benefit of sin, uh, but you do see the sin and them taking advantage of their position so that they might be able to, um, to, to have what they wanted. Because of that, the people want a king. Uh, they come to Samuel, they say, you're old, your sons are not people we want to follow, and so give us a king. And if those were the only reasons, I think we would be probably okay with that. If, if their main concern was uh, their last good spiritual leader was getting too old to truly lead and that there was nobody to really take his place, so let's go a different direction, we would say that's honorable. We would, we would appreciate that. But that's not really all it is. If you look there in verse 5 of chapter 8, Therefore, appoint us a king, they said, to judge us the same as all the other nations have. You see that again down in verse 20. Then we will be like all the other nations. Our king will judge us, go out before us, and fight our battles. Well, the first reason, not wanting to follow Samuel's son, that's a good reason, but the idea of fitting in with the world around you, not a good reason. And not something that, that, that should have been their motivation. Well, of course, it upsets Samuel. Samuel goes and tells the Lord exactly what the people are asking for. And God says in verse 11, these are the rights of the king. Or excuse me, uh, I, I skipped ahead a little bit. Verse 7, listen to the people and everything they say to you. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me as their king. They are doing the same thing to you that they have done to me since the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt until this day, abandoning me and worshiping other gods. You see there that in, in one sense, the way they worded it, give us a king to judge us. They are asking for someone to replace Samuel. But on the other side, asking for a king, even though God was their king, was a rejection of God. They're trying to replace both Samuel and God and be like the nations around them. And you can, you can probably tell pretty quickly this is not going to turn out well. Well, God asked Samuel to remind them of the warnings that came. And I want to read these because these are going to be important a little later on in a, in a lesson to come. 
But there in verse 11, it says, These are the rights of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and put them to his youth and his chariot on his horses or running in front of his chariot. He can appoint them for his use as commanders of thousands or commanders of fifties to plow his ground and reap his harvest or to make his weapons of war and the equipment for his chariot. He can take your daughters to become perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He can take your best fields, vineyards, and olive orchards and can give them to his servant. He can take a tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give them to his officials and servants. He can take your male servants your female servant, your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He can take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves can become his servant. When that day comes, you will cry out because the king you've chosen for yourselves, but the Lord won't answer you on that day. That is a dire warning. Samuel is helping them to realize what they're asking for. They're just focusing on the good stuff. They want to look like the nations around them. They want to have a judge the same way the other nations do. They want to have a a king who will go out and fight their battles for them. And Samuel's saying, that's not it. That's not all we're really dealing with. He can make you his slaves. He can make your children his slaves. He can force you to go to battle for him. He can force you to do anything he wants because he will be king. And of course, they don't listen to Samuel. There in verse 19, it says, they refused to listen. They said, we must have a king over us. Then we will be like the other nations. They wanted nothing else. Notice verse 21, Samuel listened and then repeated uh, those concerns of the people to the Lord. And God said, listen to them, appoint a king for them. And so Samuel goes about to do that job. As you move forward in the story, we we are introduced to Saul. Saul, he's a a Benjamite, and he's an impressive young man. Uh, Impressive because he really is the picture of a king. He's a head taller than anyone else. He's bigger. He seems to be strapping. He's somebody who's impressive looking. And that's exactly what the people are going to want in a king. And I find it interesting that, you know, I I grew up hearing the people chose Saul. And it does say that in part of the text. But it also says that God chose Saul. God is the one who worked out the details for Saul's uh, donkeys to go missing. And he had to go searching for them. And, of course, he goes and he uh, finds Samuel. Uh, doesn't seem to know a lot about Samuel, which might tell us one of the problems early on with Saul. But he goes and he finds Samuel, and Samuel, uh, God, God identifies to Samuel that this is the very man who is supposed to be the first king of Israel. Uh, and then you've got Saul anointing him as king when you get over into chapter 10, and then right after that, Saul gives him signs for him to believe that Samuel truly is assigning him as the first king of Israel. Uh, The first sign is that he'll find two men at Rachel's grave and have an interaction with them. And then he's going to find three men at Tabor and then a group of prophets. Uh, But the ultimate sign is this last one, that he would be filled with the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord. And when that happens, he will know truly that God has chosen him for this task of leading, uh, leading Israel, of being their king. And then we have a little later on in the text, in chapter 10, that he is announced as king. Uh, verse 25 of chapter 10, Samuel proclaimed to the people the rights of kingship. He wrote them on a scroll, which he placed in the presence of the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people home. The people are excited to finally have this king that they've been looking for. But not all of the people are excited. Some of the people, they, they don't see in this man the kind of, uh, of king that they're looking for. Uh, and so you have some who, who don't agree with the idea of him becoming king. That is until he proves himself. Nahash 
the Ammonite comes up and lays siege to a, a city of Israel. And, and the men of Jabesh Gilead, uh, they, want, they need help. They need to be rescued. And of course, Saul is the one who comes to their rescue. He sends out a, a difficult message of, with the chopping up of oxen and says, this is what's going to happen to your oxen if you don't come and battle with us. And of course, they go and they battle. Chapter 11, verse 11 says, The next day Saul organized the troops into three divisions. During the morning watch, they invaded the Ammonite camp and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. There were survivors, but they were so scattered that no two of them were left together. That leading of the people solidified in the people's mind that Saul really could be a great king. And being a great king he would be able to uh, sit on that throne. They would accept him. And so Samuel goes on and offers a speech. The people believe in him finally uh, as, as kings. They believe in Saul. And so Samuel offers a speech and says, these are some of the difficult things you've been doing, but God has given in and God has given you what you wanted. Here is the king you've chosen, the one you requested in verse 13. Uh, look, this is the king the Lord has placed over you. If you fear the Lord, worship and obey him. If you don't rebel against the Lord's command, then both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. But if you do disobey, it will be worse for you than it was even for your ancestors. Now you do have that uh, they do seem to repent. Uh, verse 19, they pleaded with Samuel, pray to the Lord your God for your servant so that we will not die. For we have added to all our sins the evil of requesting a king for ourselves. They, they recognize that what they've done is offensive to God. But Samuel says, don't be afraid. Instead, worship the Lord. And don't turn away from obeying him. A couple of lessons to consider as we wrap up this short section of scripture. And the first is that God is king. Whether we want to accept that or not, whether that is what we agree with or not, it doesn't change the fact that God is king. Not just king of Israel, not just king of a small country over in the Middle East. He is king of all creation, king of heaven and earth, king of every man, woman, child who has ever walked this earth and ever will. He is an amazing God, and he is the king of of all. There's nothing we can do to replace him. And any king that we set up in his place will be far insufficient, especially when compared to him. You also find here in the example of Samuel, as contrasted with the example of Eli, as contrasted with the example we're going to see with Saul in the next section of scripture, God's rulers who act in God's ways are a blessing for God's people. That's still true today. I've been involved in a, with, with several churches, several with elders. And I know many, many preachers who have been involved with elders in many different uh, locations all over this country and all over this world. And one of the consistent statements made by preachers and congregations is that a good eldership can make a congregation flourish and a bad eldership cannot be overcome. God's rulers have to act in God's ways if we're going to expect God to bring his blessings on his people. I'm so thankful that we at Edwards Lake have good godly leaders that sit together and, and, and discuss things and try their best to find ways to bring about glory to God through his people with our local family. We need to support them and lift them up and help them to be more of what God has called them to be. One last lesson is found there at the end of chapter 12 where Samuel tells the people, don't turn away from to follow worthless things that can't profit or rescue you. They are worthless. That is so tempting for us as people to turn away from God, turn away from his promises, turn away from the blessings that he gives in order to pursue worthless things. 
And we do that a lot. We, we will pursue politics. We will pursue uh, our, our understanding of the way the world works. We will pursue some conspiracy. We will pursue some sort of, uh, of, of entertainment uh, or hobby, whatever it is. We, we follow after worthless things all the time that all of us would agree they don't rescue us. There's no eternal profit to those things. Ultimately, they are worthless. And I think we need to be careful that we're not pursuing those things to the absence of pursuing the will of God. Instead, let us pursue God's will. Let us act as we know God is king and let him truly be in charge of our lives and the way that we live. Our next section is going to be the next three chapters. That's not supposed to say 1 Kings. That's supposed to say 1 Samuel. And to be honest, I think it said 1 Kings in every single one of these lessons, so I apologize for that. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13 through 15. That'll be our next section. Thank you.